Hey, hey, hey. How is everybody today, tonight, or tomorrow? I'm coming to you not live from my room, and I have to say that this setup worked out pretty convenient for me, actually, because I don't know if I'm funny or not after like 9 p.m. I've just never tried. Um, it's like I got turned into a werewolf, and I've only done the transformation a few times, so I'm just getting into the routine still, just still working out the kinks. And that was my one furry pun of the evening. I know there's bound to be some furries watching this after seeing our busty Perry the platypus poster. So I wanna make sure I get that demographic. We love that you're here. <laughs> but yeah, I go to bed pretty early. I would say in terms of my daily habits, I'm what you'd call painfully well-adjusted. Like it's 9 p.m., I'm tired. I stop working. A few minutes later, I go to the kitchen for a glass of soy milk to go with my crunchy cereal. Maybe I make eye contact with my housemates on the way out there, maybe I don't. And, you know, cut to me a few minutes later, I'm scrolling through, I'm on my computer, I'm scrolling through an article that's titled like, cheers, queers, craft brews are the queers of the beer world. And I don't even like beer. And after I'm done crunching and scrolling, I usually like to brush my teeth for an inordinately long amount of time. And if I'm feeling especially wholesome, I might even read my book for a little bit before the earplugs go in, the face mask goes on. I'm like that until my alarm that I have set to like random radio static for some reason goes off the next morning at seven. A bad night for me is like when I'm, you know, end up saying, it's like been a hard day. I end up saying, screw it. I'm watching TikToks until 1030 on a school night. After that, I'm just laying there guiltily like, fuck, what have I done? But don't think I'm so well adjusted in all parts of my life. Who could be? For example, one of my admittedly many social shortcomings is that I'm kind of uncomfortable around men. I'm not saying that when I see someone who I presume looks male identifying, like I cross the street or like move tables in the live when a guy sits down next to me or like email my prof when I'm paired with a male lab partner. It's not like that. It's just that unless I'm forced to get to know them through work, classes or sports, I'm bad at talking to them and making friends with them. And I don't really know why. I mean, I don't have a brother, but that's not a very good excuse. I mean, it's not like only children grow up not knowing how to talk to anyone um, or only knowing how to talk to adults or, well, actually I might be onto something there. But like, I don't have a traumatic experience that I can point to as to why I'm not very comfortable with men. And I don't think I've gotten any more than the average societally administered dose of toxic masculinity in my life. I grew up in a small, a town so small that anyone I see when I'm out running at home is either someone I know, a dog walker, a senior citizen, or some combination of these. And the only time a guy's ever yelled something at me while I was running back home was one in winter break and he asked, hey, aren't your feet cold? My feet always get cold when I run in the winter. I'm like, nope, I'm wearing good socks. Yep, warm feet here. Just continued my run. What about my day? And, you know, in my small town high school, I, had, I was friends with some guys. When you've gone through school with more or less the same 60 people from kindergarten to senior year, you're, there's probably going to be enough familiarity with that some guys are going to jump over my, like, weird self-inflicted gender barriers. When there's only, like, 10 people you really want to be close friends with anyway, you, you know, that rural public school smart kid group, there's a good chance that a few of them, you know, like, maybe two or three are going to be male identifying. So in high school, I could sort of do it, but in my four years at Carleton, I haven't really been able to develop that same level of familiarity. So I'm not totally sure what it is, but I do know that one thing that contributes to it is the mansplaining. I think men's default interaction style is often, I know more than you, and that can cause some friction because that's also my default interaction style. So we can come into a bit of conflict because of that. We've all been in those sorts of situations, I think, you know, you're like, say something in front of a guy like, you know, in my four years at Carleton, I've never really learned what epistemology and ontology are. And as soon as you say it, you brace yourself because you know <laughs> that you're definitely about to find out. Like, oh boy, I walked into that one. <laughs> um, showing up at my STEM majorist, saying something like that and just getting schooled. So to all guys, I'm not gonna say, it's not you, it's me, <laughs> because it's definitely both of us. And I still don't understand what epistemology and ontology are. So don't hit me up in the comments. But yeah, I'm a bio major, but not like you guys are thinking. I'm not a pre-med bio major. I'm not interested in performing any life-saving surgery or curing disease. I'm just interested in touching plants, knowing how to identify lots of different plant species, and sometimes being out in the field and, you know, being able to 
reach down and grab a little foliage and crunch it up in my fingers and say to someone, smell this leaf, it smells like licorice. And then sometimes when I'm in the field, you know, I imagine the plants that I'm working with are talking to me and that they have different voices and personalities. You know, there might be a native flower species that's like, OMG, ooh, ooh, do you know who pollinated me today? A hawk moth. This year I'm gonna have so many fertile seeds. Or maybe there's an invasive grass species that's like, hey prick, yeah, you. Oh, you don't even wanna know what I'm doing to the soil microbial community under my roots. And I think that kind of thing is about as far from pre-med as you can get. That's like that kind of personification is practically in the humanities, right? There's actually a book I read for a, for a class and for pleasure, if I'm being honest, that's called Nature's Economy. It's all about how economy started out with a very different meaning than it has today and how ecology is really a humanities discipline disguised as a hard science. Intriguing ideas for someone who borderline wants to express themselves, borderline wants to be taken seriously. I do have to say, I see the personalities between ecology and econ. For example, they both love charts a lot. If you've ever looked in a biology textbook and seen one of those illustrations of words like competition, plant diversity, the mitochondria, animals mating for some reason, connected, you know, all connected by arrows, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They, both these disciplines recognize that diversity is key to success, whether it's your diversified portfolio or your diverse ecosystem. And they both, as we know them, at least, as disciplines laid out by white men, erroneously place a premium on competition while undervaluing the importance of cooperation and facilitation and making communities prosper. All right. I need that. I think it's time to get off my soapbox now and lather up for my soap joke. I'll wrap up with something that I pulled out of my recycling bin just for you guys tonight. So I live in Woe House on campus, right? It's Carlton's Organizing and Activism Interest House. I love it. I've lived here for three years, so I obviously don't have any better ideas or options. No, but I really do love it. I love the community. I love my housemates. It's really fun. But there's always something with communal living, isn't there? You know, it's never perfect. There are always going to be little, at least little things that are going to bother you. You, you. you know, if you grew up conflict avoidant, you might be annoyed, but rather than say anything, you might just bitch about it to your friends in the greater YouTube community. Um, like living with 13 housemates, you're bound to learn some new takes on passive aggression. For example, this case that I call the recycling incident. So I guess what happened was for a few weeks, one or a few people in our house had been having some trouble struggling with the, you know, garbage versus recycling dichotomy. You know, they weren't putting stuff in the right places. And so one housemate who was confident in their recycling prowess took matters into their own hands to get our house on the right track with recycling once and for all. And they had a pretty ingenious plan for doing this, which was writing an exhaustive list of what can and can't be recycled on our house whiteboard and also in a frenzied red sharpied hand on those all of those little recycling 101 signs that Carlton puts up everywhere. So it was like, yes, cardboard, empty spaghetti jars, failed attempts at homework assignments. No, Friday flowers, Kleenex, leaves and soil from the backyard. And I don't know if the recycling problems that called this person's considerable energies have been resolved since then or not. But I do know that the whole week that that stuff was on the whiteboard, I felt like I was living on the side of a Dr. Bronner's soap bottle. Thank you. That's been my time. Good night.